Praise be to the name of the living God. As the Apostle Paul would say it, grace and peace to you from God, the Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. We want to welcome you all who are coming, uh, joining us in this worship service. We are grateful to those who have joined via KBC and also those who are joining us online. We are glad that we can be able to worship together as we worship the Lord in the beauty of his holiness. Thank you so much, our senior Pastor Nyaga, for the kind words of introduction and for your welcome so that I may fellowship with you on this blessed Sabbath day. I bring to you warm greetings from Kindu Adventist Hostel where I serve, and there we believe in compassionate care and healing hearts. We believe that it's not just about physical healing, but we also do holistic healing of the body of Christ, of God's sons and daughters who come to visit with us. Uh, today, we want to reflect on our theme, Outliers for Mission. Outliers for Mission. In his book, Outliers, Malcolm Gladwell explains the dictionary meaning of the word outliers, and he says this is uh, something that is situated away from or classified differently from the main or related body. It is something that, si that is situated away from or classified differently from the main or related body. He also calls it a statistical observation that is markedly different in value from others of the same sample. Please underscore the word markedly different in value. And this is the word that we are reflecting on outliers. I have seen them all the time. I have heard about them all the time. I have read about them all the time. They are outliers all over in different areas, in different fields, in different walks of life. Wilkinson, in his book, The Prayer of Jabez, calls them gimpa for God. And as he had addresses the word gimpa, he says this is someone who is not satisfied with mediocrity. Someone who always wants to take whatever is taking a notch higher. Someone who wants to give it the extra touch. Someone who is not satisfied by mean achievements but wants to take it a notch higher. So these outliers, these gimpers, are men and women who do things out of the ordinary. They go beyond expectation. We see them in sports. You hear of the names like Tiger Woods, all the footballers, basketballers, uh, tennis players, uh, rally drivers. There are outliers out there who outstand every other person in their field and excel beyond expectation. In wealth creation, we know outliers like Bill Gates and the wealthiest people that are around the world. They are not satisfied and always want to create more and more wealth and when they have created enough, they still want to create a little more wealth because they are not satisfied. Even in health, we've heard of the blue zones. Whether it's in Japan or whether it's in Loma Linda, California, these blue zones where people have uh, emphasized on good health and, 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 and experience longevity more than any others. Malcolm in his books, talks about the Rossetto family in southern Italy, who also live much longer than anyone else because they are outliers. And so this morning, as we reflect on outliers for mission, we are asking ourselves, could we possibly have some outliers for mission? Could we possibly have some outliers here for the work of God, for the word of God, for the sake of God, could it be possible that there would be some people right here at Nairobi Central Church, those who are worshipping online, those who are worshipping by other forms of media, could it be possible that we would have outliers, not just in sports, not just in wealth creation, not just in any aspect of life, not even just in academics? Could we 
possibly have outliers for mission. I see them all the time in my Bible. I see David stand out as an outlier, goes against all odds and faces Goliath, who is taunting and challenging the Israelites. I see Esther standing out at a great personal risk to save the Jews from an impending genocide. That's an outlier. I see the slave girl come up front and save Naaman the leper. That's an outlier who is willing to take the risk and do something that nobody else within her sphere or ranks would do. I see Noah stand out and becomes a righteous man in a perverted generation. And God looks at Noah and finds favor with Noah, an outlier in the field of God. I see Samson, son of Manoah, come up as an outlier and takes the Philistines systematically and sweeps the uh, populations of them one after another, one after another, empowered by the spirit of the living God. He destroys them again and again as an outlier. But today, brothers and sisters, our focus is on 1 Samuel chapter 14. Our focus is on two outliers who are bent on an exploit for mission and they go beyond the ordinary against all odds and prove themselves to be outliers for mission. The Bible records that there is a detachment of Philistines encamped at Michmash. Depending on how your Bible is, my Bible would begin this pericope, this passage of scripture from 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 23, and continues to 1 Samuel chapter 14, verse 1. And I read in your hearing, Now a detachment of Philistines had gone out to the pass at Michmash. One day Jonathan, son of Saul, said to the young man bearing his armor, Come! Let's go over to the Philistine outpost on the other side. But he did not tell his father. Now you know that Jonathan is son of Saul, the king of Israel. And here in our story, the Bible records that there is a detachment, a platoon of soldiers from Philistine who are camping at Michmash. What are they doing at Michmash? Why are the Philistines camping at Michmash? Now, let me give you the geography. Michmash is way up in the north, and down in the south, we have Geba. Why are the Philistines camping at Michmash? Because the Israelites are down here at Geba. What are the Philistines doing at Michmash, way up in the north, when the Israelites are down south at Geba? Now you need to go a few lines before that in 1 Samuel chapter 13 and get the history. Verse 17 of 1 Samuel chapter 13 says, Raiding parties went out from the Philistine camp in three detachments, one turned towards Oprah in the vicinity of Shaul, another towards Beth uh, Horon, and the third towards the border overlooking the valley of uh, Zibium facing the desert. Why are these Philistine detachments camped in these strategic places? They just want to go and finish the Israelites. They want to go and rot them and annihilate them completely. They want to tear them down and now, in our story, they are camped strategically at Michmash in the north, waiting to raid the camp of Israel. Now, if you go a little deeper into the story, a scheme had been planned in such a way that at this point in time, Israel was disarmored. The Bible says there was not a single goldsmith 
in Israel. They would take their plowshares to be beaten for them by the Philistines. So they depended on the Philistines for any form of blacksmith. Now, the Philistines had done this strategically so that they may disequip the army of Israel. At this point in time, they don't have any armory because they are depending on the Philistines to sharpen their objects. And obviously, the Philistines will only sharpen their plows but not sharpen spears, javelins, and arrows for them. And at this time, the Israelite army is so much disarmed and vulnerable. And now, the Philistines are camped up in the north at Michmash. The Israelites are down south in Geba. And they're ready to be attacked at any moment. At that time, Jonathan, son of Saul, says to the young man who was sis Amabera, the Bible says, Come, let's go over to the Philistine outpost on the other side. But he did not tell his father. Now that's my first take-home point for you. You don't have to tell everybody everything that you are planning to do in your life. I, I have tried it a few times, I have failed. I once told my uncle about this farming that I wanted to do, and he gave me all the stories how it was impossible to do that kind of farming. Let me tell you, you don't have to tell everybody everything that you plan to do. I remember, yeah, I, as a young man going, to, uh, going through my youthful days, I even told a friend of mine the lady I was planning to marry. And he so discouraged me from marrying this lady. I never married this lady. But soon after that, I found him trying to hook this lady to another man. Well, I thank God I married the lady whom I married. I didn't marry that one anyway. All I'm simply telling you is don't tell everybody everything that you are planning to do. You know, even in this day, when we live in a selfie age, people take post of themselves, of your children, of your birthdays, of your celebrations, and you post them out on social media. You are exposing yourself too much. You are telling too much about you. Everybody knows everything about you. Where you took breakfast, where you took lunch, where you went for swimming, where you went for church. Everybody knows everything about you. You are exposing yourself too much. Jonathan, the son of Saul, is going to attack the Philistines, but he did not tell anyone what he was going to do. Please, that's your first take home. At this point in time, my Bible tells me that uh, Saul, who is the king, is not even in Gaba, where the Israelites, the Israelites are camping. Now, listen to the geography again. The Philistines are way up at the north at Michmash. The Israelites are in Gaba. But Saul, the king of Israel, has gone farther down south to Gibeah. He's running farther away from the battlefront. And he's not alone. He goes down, down to Gibeah with 600 men. Where are they needed? I mean, the Philistines are up north. The Israelites are here in Gaba. Why would the king of Israel, together with 600 men, go farther down to Gibeah? What a shame. Now, the interesting thing is that he is not alone. The Bible says he is together with Ahijah. Ahijah. Who is Ahijah? Ahijah is the man who is wearing the ephod. Who is this who is wearing the ephod? He is the priest. He is the man of God. He is the man we expect to help out, to, to help solve the crisis. But he's hiding down there with King Saul, further down south in Gibeah. What am I telling you? Sometimes those who expect to help will disappoint you. Sometimes those you expect to come through for you will never be there for you when you need them most. This was not just a physical fight. This was a spiritual fight. This 
was a fight where the name of the God of Israel was at stake. This is where the priest was needed. This is where the wisdom from the man of God was needed. But the king of Israel, afraid, going further down. The priest himself, who was supposed to be on duty, wearing the effort, has gone further down together with the king and 600 men of Israel because they cannot be outliers when they're needed. And so the Bible says, Jonathan and his armor bearer, the two of them went over to face the Philistines and as my Bible puts it, he did not tell his father. No one was aware that Jonathan had left. But we want to compound this problem even further. Now we need to go down to verse 4. First uh, Samuel chapter 14 and we are now in verse 4. Now the Bible says, on each side of the pass that Jonathan intended to cross, to reach the Philistine outpost was a cliff. One was called Boses, the other Sene. One cliff stood to the north towards Michmash, and the other to the south towards Geba. This only makes matters complicated for Jonathan. He found, finds himself in a pass, in, in a valley, and, 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 and the Philistines, the enemies of Israel, are way up north. And Jonathan, the outlier for mission, has made up his mind that he's going to forget about his father's soul. He's going to forget about the priest who is not being responsible. He's going to forget about all the 600 men who have gone down to Geber. He's going to face these enemies of the army of God. And he decides that he's going to climb up north and face the challenge, face the battle, take up the task. But the Bible says there is no passage. He is right in the middle of the valley. But where he wants to pass, there is bosses. On the other side, which he could pass, there is also Sene. What would you do if you were Jonathan? This was not an easy task. Josephus, the church historian, says that the enemy camp, that is the Philistine camp, was on a precipice that was surrounded by three tops. It was like uh, surrounded with mountains. It, it was an impossible area to penetrate, as Josephus records it. These bosses, we are told, was like a shining white bright that made, made it even difficult for them to ascend. It was bright and shining and repelling, as it were. On the other side, Sene, is a Hebrew word meaning a thorny bush. So whichever way Saul attempted to go, it was not an easy option. Whether through buses or whether through Sene, there were difficulties all through his life. But let me tell you, my dear friends, outliers are never worried about difficulties. They are never worried about challenges. Challenges to them become opportunities. Hallelujah. Challenges to them become stepping stones. Challenges to them become the impetus that catapults them to great heights of success. These are not just obstacles. They are stepping stones to success. And so Jonathan decides to take the risk. And when you go down to verse 6, he says, the word of God says, Jonathan, say to the young armor bearer, come, let's go over to the outpost of those uncircumcised fellows. Perhaps the Lord will act on our behalf. Nothing, 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 I said, can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. And I want you to listen to me because this is my punchline. Jonathan tells his armor bearer, come, let's go over to the outpost of the Philistines, these uncircumcised men. He says, perhaps the Lord will act on our behalf. Please do know this. 
This battle did not belong to the Israelites. This battle was not Jonathan's battle. This battle was not Saul's battle. This battle belonged to the Lord. And Jonathan is able to recognize that. He says the Lord will act. It is the Lord to act. All you and I need to do is to position yourself and stand still. Allow the Lord to use you in as much as possible. But let the Lord himself take the battle and fight it for you. And so Jonathan realizes this. Jonathan did not depend on his armor. He did not depend on his armor bearer. He did not depend on his own strength. But he did depend on the unlimited power of God to grant him victory over the Philistines. That's why Jonathan is calling on his armor bearer. He says, come, come, let's go over. Who knows? The Lord will fight this battle for us. And even our students who have been prayed for here, please do know that the battle is the Lord. The Lord is simply positioning you to use you to demonstrate to the world that those who depend on the Lord, the Lord gives them victory. The Lord gives them victory. The battle is the Lord's. And Jonathan knew this, and that's why he called his armor bearer, come, come. I know it is tough. I know it is not easy. I know in Israel there are no weapons. I know it is just you and me. I know the Philistines are up in the north. I know the terrain is rugged and difficult to, to, to traverse. But I'm inviting you, come. Come, let's go over. Come, let's go to the Philistine outpost and deal with them because the Lord will act on our behalf. He knew that the battle belonged to the Lord. Another thing that is interesting is the last part, which says nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. Hallelujah. My friends, sometimes it is not about numbers. Yes, Nairobi Central Church may have the numbers, but it may be just a few people carrying through the programs of the church. And you wonder, why all these numbers of uncommitted people who do not dedicate themselves fully to the work of God? Why fill the benches? Why fill the pews and adding numbers and you're not there to show up when you're needed? You're not there to show up when your presence is needed, when your finances are needed, when your influence is needed. You sit back on the couch and warm the bench and relax out there because after all, others will do it. Shame on us. Sometimes we do that. Sometimes we do that. But here Jonathan says to his armor bearer, yes, there are 600 down there, plus my father, plus the priest. But here we are, two of us. Let's go. Who knows? The Lord can save by many, but the Lord can also save by few who have dedicated themselves and committed themselves fully to the work of God. These few would be the outliers who stand out. And so this is part of my punchline. That nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. When the Lord decides to save, he will save. He is not limited by numbers. One of my most beautiful songs is... Uh, a song that many of you will well know, the Gators sing it. It's about a few good men. A few good men. When I think about the lyrics of this song, it says, what this dying world could use is a willing man of God who dares to go against the grain and works without applause. Men who will raise the shield of faith for perfectly what is pure, whose love 
is tough and gentle, men whose word is sure. God does not need an orator who knows just what to say. He doesn't need authority to reason him away. He doesn't need an army to guarantee a win. He just needs a few good men. I want to say he just needs a few good men, a few good women. A few good men, a few good women who are ready and willing, who are committed to the cause, to the service in God's vineyard. Men full of compassion who laugh and love and cry. Men who will face eternity and aren't afraid to die. Men who will fight for freedom, honor once again. He just needs a few good men. Today on this Sabbath day, are you among these outliers? Are you among these few good men that God will want to enlist in his cause in this battle that we are faced with, in this battle between good and evil, in this battle between light, light and darkness, in this battle between Christ and Satan. God needs a few good men and women. Are you one of them? And so Jonathan tells his armor bearer, let's go. Let's go. Nothing will hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. When God decides to save, he will save, even if the others run away, even the, if the others would go farther down, down south. When God desires to do his work, he will do it, because he is not limited. It took David alone to handle Goliath. It took Esther alone to save the Jews from annihilation, from an impending genocide. Yes, it took one single slave girl to save Naaman the leper. And when Gideon came with 22,000 men, God said, mm -mm -mm, that's too much. Please thin it down. When he thinned it down to 10,000 men, God said, mm -mm, that is too much. Thin it down. When it came down to 300 men, God said, yes. That's enough because God just needs a few good men. Just a few good men and women who are outliers, who will do whatever it takes to commit themselves and dedicate themselves to the work of God and victory is assured for such people. Today I see these two few good men, Jonathan and his armor bearer. And they're ready to take the task before them. And I like what the armor bearer says to Jonathan in verse number seven. He says, do all that you have in mind. Go ahead. I am with you, heart and soul. In other words, the armor bearer says to Jonathan, I am with you fully. I am with you 100%. I'm not going to back down. I'm not going to let you down. Your back is covered. As long as I am by your side, we are in it together. And there's no turning back. And these two are ready to face the Philistines. They are ready to face the enemy. They are ready to face the battle. They are ready to go forward by faith. They are ready for the task ahead. But they're just a few good men. And sometimes it's good to put the Lord to test. God says, try me, isn't it? In tithes and offerings, he says, try me. And sometimes it's good to put the Lord to test. So in verse number eight, the word of God said, Jonathan said, come, then we will cross over towards the men and let them see us. If they say to us, wait there until we come to you, we will stay where we are and not go up to them. But if they say, come up to us, we will climb up because that will be our sign that the Lord has given them into our hands. Interesting, isn't it? Now, there are two things I want us to pick here. I say sometimes it is good to give the Lord a sign. We know Gideon asked for a sign in Judges chapter 6 and verse 39. He needed a sign. Sometimes we need to give God a sign. Sometimes 
We need to wait for a sign from God before we proceed. But I say it not always. Did I say not always? Yes. When I was a young man, I remember this story about uh, these young people who wanted to get married. And uh, they would put a sign, like tomorrow, when I go to church and I find a man who is dressed in a red shirt and a black trouser, I will know that that is the man that God desires for me. And there is this man who went into this room where these girls were staying, and he flashed some torch. You know, it's back in the village, and there, is, there, there are no lights. It's, it's dark. So he flashes a bright torch, and then he speaks with a deep voice, like, like it's God speaking. Tomorrow, when you go to church, there'll be a gentleman seated in the choir with a black trouser and a red shirt. That is the man that God wants you to be married to. And you know, this lady has been praying for God to, to give her a man. And, 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 and I don't know whether God speaks in a deep voice or in a tenor. I don't know the voice of God. But somehow people try to imitate the voice of God like in a deep, deep, double, treble bass. I don't know. And so this same man who came last night when the girls were sleeping and flashed this torch and tried to imitate the voice of God sits there right in the choir dressed in the same attire he had described to this lady last night. I said sometimes, not always, sometimes it's good to ask God for a sign. Sometimes it works. Be sure that it's a sign from God. Be sure that it's God speaking to you. Be sure that it's the voice of God that you are listening to. And there are these people who think that God has spoken to them so exclusively. If God speaks to me, he should be able to speak to you. And so our testimonies from God should be able to corroborate. If God speaks to you exclusively as if you own God, there is a problem. There is a problem. Some of those are the ones who want to deputize the Holy Ghost, and they think that they can speak like they are so closer to God than anybody else. If God should speak to you, he should speak to someone else. And so these people have set up a sign, but there's another problem. What Jonathan is suggesting is way out of the ordinary. Whoever goes into battle and shows himself up to the enemy, no one does that. Not even the most foolish fool would show himself up to the enemy. But somehow, Jonathan says to the armor bearer, we will go. We will not hide. We will show ourselves up. And when they call us, we will climb up. But when they say, stay there, we will come and meet you, mm -mm 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 -mm. that's not a good sign. The, the whole idea of showing themselves up was humanly thinking foolishness. Who does that? You go to Israel today and see what is happening in Gaza. They don't show themselves up. They hide and send those missiles and tornadoes from a hidden, you know, safe zone. No one wants to expose themselves to danger. But here, Jonathan says, we will show ourselves up. And that's exactly what they did. They showed themselves up to the Philistines in verse number 11. And true to his pledge before God, the Philistines told them, come up, come up to where we are. Remember, I've already told you the geography. There is a cliff that is impossible to penetrate. But Jonathan and his armor bearer, being outliers, they are not going to be deterred by anything. Nothing is going to stop them. Nothing is going to hinder them from achieving God's desire for their lives and for Israel. And when they listen to those words, come up, they know that God has granted them victory. Hallelujah. And they decide to climb. They decide to climb. But the most 
interesting thing to me in this passage is the manner in which they were climbing these cliffs. My Bible tells me in verse number 13 that Jonathan climbed using his hands and feet. He climbed using his hands and using his feet. What does that mean? Jonathan gave God his all. He did not reserve anything for the cause of God. Men and women of this church, a time comes such as this, when God is in need of people who will climb using their hands and using their feet, using their body, using everything, and I say everything, that God has availed to them. Jonathan did not reserve anything. There are no spare warriors. It was just two of them. The rest had gone down, down further south. Jonathan and his armor bearer did not shrink back. They showed themselves and moved forward by faith, trusting in God to deliver. And they made every effort to climb high up, not relaxing in any way. My brothers and sisters, we are living in tough times. We are living in difficult times. Resources are scarce. Economies are crumbling down. It is getting more and more difficult to serve the Lord. And it is in these times that God is calling for few good men. That God is calling for few good women. Few good young people who will stand true to their calling. Who will step up against all odds and show themselves up ready for battle. The question is, are you going to be counted? Are you going to be among the few that God will use in these difficult times? Are you going to be among the few who will climb using your all, using your hands and using your feet? Are you going to be among those who will climb against all odds to reach to God's will for your life, for your mission, for God's glory. This is what God desires of the men of this church. This is what God desires of the women of this church. This is what God desires of the young men in this church. God is looking for a people who will be true and committed to duty as the needle to the pole. Those who will stand for the truth, though the heavens fall. Those who will put their best foot forward in the work of God. Those who will not shrink their hands from giving and from serving, but will serve wholeheartedly for the advancement of the cause of God. And as we close, listen to verse 14. The Bible says, in that first attack, Jonathan and his armor bearer killed some 20 men in an area of about half an acre. Hallelujah. What great success is this? Given to this young man, man of God, against all odds, the Bible counts this as the first exploit of Jonathan the outlier and comes back with great success because of the level of commitment, the level of dedication, the level of surrender, the level of giving himself to God. God met him with success. And I want to challenge you today that if you so commit yourself to God, that if you so entrust yourself to God, you too will meet with success along the way. You too, your efforts will be met with victory. Your efforts will be met with great honor. Your efforts will be met with great success because God himself will come your way and grant you success for his own glory. My appeal today, my brothers and sisters, is that all of us should commit ourselves to the work of God. For we live in tough times, difficult times, Others may not do it, doesn't matter. 
A few good men is just good enough. A few good women is just enough. Nothing can they hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. Nothing can hinder the Lord from accomplishing the purposes that he has desired for this church, for his own mission. As long as we have outliers who are willing to submit themselves and surrender and to be used of God, God will meet your efforts with success as he did for Jonathan and his armor bearer for his own glory. And may God bless you in Jesus' name.